for years, then we haven't even copyrighted our material. We allow people to copy it, to give it away. That's what we want. <laughs> Welcome to <laughs> Wacken Atheist with Dr. Kent, the science gent, lab coat and everything. Since Eric doesn't seem to talk about science anymore, I guess we'll go with the Hoven to at least dresses like he does. Welcome to Apologia, where a former Christian takes a look at the claims of Christians. If you're new to the channel, why not take a second to tap on the subscribe button so that you'll be notified when new science, theology, and news videos come out. I'm very excited today because... We're going to discuss uh, ERVs tonight. When I was a creationist like Kent and was personally investigating the claims of evolution, the fused chromosome 2 in humans was the discovery that sealed the deal for me in the affirmation of evolution. But closely behind that was the startling evidence found in endogenous retrovirus insertions. Basically, ERVs, they are known as a big proof of evolution. And a lot of people will say that it's the number one proof. For some reason, no popular creationists address this scientific discovery. So I was thrilled when Kent took it up. Uh, Conspiracy Cats has been saying he whipped me really bad in the debate because I didn't want to talk about ERVs. It's true. It's exactly what I say. I whipped Kent really bad. You're my hero for pinning him down on this. Thanks for joining me, Conspiracy Cats. I spend all my time talking to people who think the Earth is flat. I never thought I'd be this two-dimensional myself. A guy who calls himself Conspiracy Cats. I don't know his real name. Is it Conniving Kitty, the Faking Feline, or the Plotting Pussy, or Conspiracy Cats? Uh... I can't see that he ever uses his real name. All right, well, Conspiracy Cat's just a nickname, isn't it? It's short for Al. I thought cats had hair. Well, I do have hair. Lots of it. Just not in the places you can see it. Don't worry about it, man. Here's what Kent said about me recently. Paulogia, he's got a, a, comic, a cartoon of himself, real muscular, you know. You ought to see him in real life. <laughs> this is pure fantasy land, okay? Take a look at the real Paulogia. I find it amazing that all these people that attack you and attack myself online... They all have fantasy names for themselves. Kent, it wouldn't matter whether I call myself Conspiracy Cats or Fergal McButtmuncher. The fact remains, ERVs are real, and they are still excellent evidence for evolution. A virus? Uh, I'm sorry, Iris Vey? They got a ban on using the word Iris Vey. You have to use Igpe Attenley uh, to, to get around it, because if you use that, that bad word, Iris Vey, they were going to shut off YouTube. <laughs> That's paranoid. To be honest, Kent, I don't think mentioning the word virus is going to cause YouTube to shut down. But I do think mentioning the term endogenous retrovirus might make your brain shut down. Uh, he's not, he said, I was not prepared to answer his assertion that ERVs are evidence for his religion of evolution. No, Kent. It is you who said you were not prepared to answer his question. Yeah, I think well, let's do ERV in a separate debate. I'm not prepared for that. Well, it's kind of catchy. Maybe someone should turn that into a song. Housekeeping genes. I'm not prepared for that. The evolution theory. I'm not prepared for that. We have inserted DNA code from an ERV. I'm not prepared for that. I'd never heard that one used before. Never heard of it. One of your viewers asked you about it back in August 2015. I was speaking about in, in endogenous retroviruses. And I read a bunch from creation.com. I have read very little on that. I do. I remember reading some article about it someplace. I don't have an opinion about it, uh, David. Okay. Now, the uh, and ERVs are uh, all have a function, and so they're claim. That's why I was shocked when he brought that up in the debate. And I said, I'm not prepared for that. Nobody ever. I've never heard anybody use that as evidence for evolution. Like what? Back in December 2019, on my O oh, Whacking Day video, Kent left a comment asking me for my three best lines of evidence for evolution. And ERVs was literally the first one I gave you in my reply. So they're making a big deal out of uh, hoping I wasn't prepared for that. Well, come on. <laughs> it's dumb. I do agree that it was dumb that you've had over 200 debates in evolution and yet you've never come across the term endogenous retrovirus. I do think it's dumb that you've done over 200 debates in evolution and you still couldn't explain what the term allele frequency means. I, I listened to what he said a couple times. I said, I can't believe that this guy could possibly believe such a thing. How could we believe it? What even are endogenous retrovirus insertions? For those who don't know, which includes Kent, as of five minutes before this was recorded. Endogenous retroviruses are viral elements in the genome that closely resemble and can be derived from retroviruses. They are abundant in the genomes of jawed vertebrates. Well, Kent, you might not be able to explain what an ERV is, but I sure admire your ability to Google stuff and read it straight from a page on the internet. Right then, let's review the slides from the debate. 
I'm sure you're familiar with what uh, um, ERVs are, endogenous retroviral DNA insertions. Okay, now we know that these are insertions that viruses put into our DNA, and they've all got the same characteristic structure. They've all got the gag gene, the pol gene, the EMV gene, and these long terminal repeats on either side. And we know what those genes do. One of the genes causes the the caps uh, the, the the capsid around the virus. One of them contains reverse transcriptase, which is a purely viral enzyme. Um, in this, um, um, and the EMV one has. A couple of different uh, jobs, but uh, essentially it allows the virus to enter uh, enter a cell. Now, these retroviral DNAs are uh, these are inserted into the human genome. Now, the way that we use ERVs as evidence to back up the fossil records is what we've got there on the screen right now. These are the fossil records um, that that have existed for a long time. We start off with obviously Afarensis right at the bottom, all the way up to Homo sapiens at the top. And those colored dots represent how ERVs are used to back up the fossil record. Now, an ERV insertion, we look right down at the, very, at the one at the very bottom, we've got that little blue dot there. These ERV insertions happen in a one in a 50 million chance location. I want that number to sink in, a one in a 50 million chance location. So if I'm infected with a virus and you're infected with the same virus, the chance of, of that uh, integration happening at the same point in our DNA is one in 50 million. But we can pass that insertion on to our offspring. Now, if we have a look at the, the fossils uh, here, we can see where it's marked in blue. And this is obviously a representation of, if you want to see all the exact uh, examples, I've linked a scientific paper that goes through them on the right-hand side. So you know I'm not just making this up. Um, but we can see that the, uh, the blue insertion is at the bottom and that filters through all the organisms, all the, all the, uh, the, the different species of human uh, that are there, but when we get to uh, Homo erectus, then we get a fresh insertion, a yellow one. We don't see the yellow before, but we see it in all the descendants afterwards, and so on and so on and so on. These insertions in that one in a 50 million chance location. May I try my hand at an analogy for those who, like Kent, didn't catch the full implications of what you laid out there? By all means. Suppose that you and a friend discovered a collection of 10 books, and you were curious about where these books came from. Despite wildly different covers, you find that the contents have similarities and differences to varying degrees. For example, we find that page 20 is the same in all the books. It must be the same author of all the books from scratch, repeating himself in some places, says your friend. But you notice that on seven of the books, page 20 has an identical splatter of what appears to be spaghetti sauce in the exact same shape and location. It seems impossible that seven individual drops fell on seven different pages in the exact same spot and with the exact same splatter. So you suggest that each page 20 is actually a photocopy of a page from an earlier book and that seven of these copies were made after someone spilled some sauce on it. Of those seven, we notice that they also have page 41 in common, four copies with an identical random scribble in the corner and three without. But two of those without have an identical smudge on page 113. And these artifacts can be arranged in a nested hierarchy helping to identify which pages were copied from which originals that the modern books would have in common. The identical words on the pages could conceivably be from a common author copying and pasting material into otherwise fresh printings of unique books, but the sauce stain, the smudge, the scribble, and other imperfections don't come from a word processor. If these books represent the DNA of modern life forms, the smudge, scribble, and stain represent endogenous retrovirus insertions. They are virtually impossible to explain by special creation from scratch, but make complete sense if life forms have common ancestors. Hello. Matt, we are. Oh, you didn't answer yet. <laughs> Hi, Matt. Will you answer the phone, please? Hey, Dr. Hovind. How are you? Wait. Did Kent call Matt Powell? Just look me up on YouTube, Matt Powell. Official is the name of the YouTube channel. And um, got some good content on there. Good content? Like his science, falsely so-called, anti-science movie? Which is a movie in roughly the same sense that a 90-minute quarantine staff meeting video call is a movie. If we limit our consideration of Matt's infamous blunders to his bizarre takes on science... We're talking about the guy who says that dinosaurs were decapitated by an asteroid, that there's air in space, that we can carbon date lead, and that all science teachers are required to sign some kind of anti-god waiver. That's just an introduction. I don't mean to poison the well or commit a genetic fallacy. So, what do you have for us, Matt? He said that yeah, the ERVs are proof for evolution. So I'd like to get your take on that. 
Um, not really too much. It's interesting. I hadn't really heard too much about it before today. So, <laughs> Kent's expert hadn't heard of ERVs before today. Uh, but just doing some basic research on it just shows the evidence is on our side. So we got them. There's no doubt about it. <sighs> this is sure to be a quality rebuttal. Based on the evidence and the mathematical possibilities, um, I would say it's the number one proof of creation. And right. we can just turn this around on them based on the fact that actually 14 of our human ERVs, because everybody has them in their DNA, are found in the same location as chimp DNA. So they'll say, well, see, 14 are found in the same place. But what they leave out is that we actually have 98,000 ERVs in our body. And so that means that we are 99.9998% different than a chimp and then what they have in their DNA. I found what seems to be Matt's source for this claim, a 2015 article by Russ Miller, whom you may remember from Eric Hoven's Grand Canyon movie. Miller's source may or may not come from a now-deleted posting by Dr. Charles Jackson from Eric's other creation movie. But unfortunately, Miller doesn't cite any source for this 14 out of 98,000 claim. As much as I'd like to take this holder of zero degrees in any topic at all at his word, his bio tells me you don't have to believe anything I tell you. So I took that advice and went ahead to check the numbers for myself. Miller's 98,000 number seems to come from Wikipedia, which cites this paper, which affirms that the 98,000 number applies to virus elements and fragments and not the identifiable, sequenceable human ERVs. The more common measure I find is that 8% of the genome is affected by viruses. But regardless, these fragments aren't useful as a denominator. So let's focus on the numerator. HERVs are divided into 31 families. And let's take a quick look at just one such family known as HERVW. This study compares the 211 sequenced HERVW insertions found among primates. Of these 211 in humans, we share 205 with chimps, 97%. 207 with gorillas, 98%, 205 with orangutan, 97%, and 190 with gibbons, 90%. Percentages aside, it should be clear here that there are over 200 matches in this single ERV family alone. Miller's undocumented number of 14 total, as repeated blindly by Matt, who looked it up that afternoon, seems pulled from the air and has no bearing in reality, unless someone's able to show me his source. If so, please provide a link in the comments. While Kent will assert... Basically, all these things are is just lines on paper. Right. This research demonstrates how identical phylogenetic trees are reproduced over and over for each individual ERV considered. The lines represent DNA analysis. And so the mathematical odds are totally in our favor. May the odds be ever in your favor. Um, maybe you should check that math, Matthew. We, we have 99.999% of a difference between us and a chimp. And so if you round that off, that's 100%. We are 100% different than these animals. So I've heard evolutionists say, well, we are, we are apes. We are evolved apes. No, we're not. Well, no, some, and Matt, hold it. Some of them are. I debated some of them. They, they are. Is that a crack at me? And so we are not evolving. We're all devolving right now. And these beneficial mutations, quote unquote, that they say are so good for our genes. I'd like to note that ERV insertions aren't mutations, Matt. They're viral attacks. The more research we do, the more we find out that these uh, endogenous uh, retroviruses are causing problems in our DNA. Lest anyone hasn't been following the news, viruses do cause problems, everyone. And if we were truly related to chimps, these mathematical odds would be much more in favor. And may the odds be ever in your favor. Uh, I talked to uh, Dr. Uh, Fabich today uh, at Answers in Genesis. I've heard of them. He's written many articles on this topic. Since Kent and Matt have no thoughts of their own on this topic, sure. Let's take a quick look at what AIG has to say. Wow. So this Dr. Fabich starts his defense by saying, since we know the word of God is true, we know that ERVs cannot be proof of evolution. Amazing. I mean, if you're actually going to admit that you've decided in advance that nothing can be proof of evolution, then what's the point in having an honest dialogue? The objections in this article are almost entirely focused on the entirely erroneous idea that ERVs must necessarily be junk, part of a non-coding region of DNA, or somehow impairing coding DNA. Like the evidence of vestigial features, creationists misrepresent the concept so that they can pretend that an exception to the non-existent rule somehow disproves the concept. A retrovirus insertion can and will happen anywhere on the genome. That's part of the power of it. 
that occasionally this insertion ends up performing an identifiable function doesn't in any way affect their usefulness in identifying common sequences and the placement of sequences. That's incidental. Look, if a creationist is arguing that it's more likely that God designed our DNA with the appearance of thousands of viral insertions than it is that our DNA actually has thousands of these insertions, then you're living in a world where no amount of evidence can convince you. Something Fabich admitted to up front, and with which Kent obviously agrees. Would you please explain, uh, Mr. Plotting Pussy, why you think this is evidence of a common ancestor? Please explain this. I don't think anybody with half a brain is going to understand why this is evidence for evolution. Yeah, well, I'm really sorry that people with only half a brain can't understand my arguments. I had, foolishly, entered the debate assuming everybody involved had a whole brain. You'll know better next time. If for some reason you're not already subscribed to Conspiracy Cats, for wildly entertaining Flat Earth, Young Earth, and Beyond Earth conspiracy debunking, find the link in the description and fix that immediately. If only to annoy Kent Hovind. Thanks for having me, Paul. Cheers. Thanks for watching. And until next time, later.